So in this video, we are going to talk about all things related to streptococcus. And so there are three activities for this video. We are dealing with activity 5-25, which is looking at a throat culture on blood auger. We are doing activity 5-26, which is going to be our camp test. And then lastly, we're gonna do activity 4-3, which is looking at bile esculent auger. So we're gonna start out with our throat culture. And we're gonna start out with the setup. So this is gonna be day one of the throat culture. So let's say that you have a sore throat. And you're, you look in your throat and you can see that your throat is very red and inflamed and possibly even pustules on the back of the throat. So if you have a really bad sore throat, one of the possibilities is that you have strep throat, what is referred to as strep throat. Strep throat is caused by an organism cause, called Streptococcus pyogenes. And so if you have this sore throat that's really severe and your throat is red and you have pustules and you go to the doctor, the doctor is likely going to do a throat culture. And so what they're going to do is they're gonna take a swab and they're gonna swab the back of the throat. Now, you don't wanna hit the uvula, this little thing that hangs down here. You're gonna aim for the back of the throat in the area of where the tonsils would be. So if you have your tonsils removed, it looks a little bit different, but you would still aim for the back of the throat and you would take that swab and you would rub it up and down on the back of the throat to try and grab any bacteria that might be back there. Now, in terms of strep throat, there are two ways that this can be done. One is called a rapid strep test. And in a rapid strep test, when they swab the back of your throat, they can um, find out within 15 minutes if the person has strep throat. But in a rapid strep test, sometimes we get a false negative, meaning that the patient has strep throat but it still tests negative on a rapid strep test. And so if the doctor does the rapid strep, but they and it comes back negative, and they still feel like it is possible that the patient has strep throat, well, then they're gonna culture that bacteria. And they're gonna culture it on what's called blood auger. And you're gonna see that in a minute. And so in our plates, we use sheep's blood auger. And the reason we use this blood auger is that streptococcus is what we call fastidious. Fastidious means that it needs certain growth requirements in order to grow. And one of those growth requirements for some species of streptococcus is blood. You're gonna see that some species use blood as a food source. So when we're trying to culture streptococcus species, we are going to culture them on blood auger. So, if the doctor still suspects strep throat after a negative rapid strep test, well, then they're gonna swab the throat and they're going to culture it on a blood auger plate. And the way that they're going to do that is that once you swab the back of your throat, you're gonna take that swab and the red indicates where you would put your swab. So in quadrant number one, you would just roll your swab over quadrant number one and you would do that several times. After you're done with your swab, you would put it back in the glass container that it comes in, and it would go into the autoclave. Now, after we put the swab on our blood auger plate, then we're just going to do a streak plate because we want to streak for isolation. And so if you think about your throat, it's not likely that you're only gonna have one type of bacteria. You might have a multitude of different bacteria there. So we need to do a, a streak plate so that we end up with isolated colonies. Because remember, the purpose of a streak plate is to separate colonies of bacteria from a large mixed population. This is exactly that. We have a mixed population in the back of the throat and we need to streak for isolation. We need to end up with isolated individual colonies. So we're gonna simply follow our streak plate technique. So after we use our swab on our plate, then we're gonna flame sterilize our loop and we're gonna let it cool. And we're gonna take that loop and we're gonna go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we want to fill in that entire first quadrant. Remember, we want to make that a lawn. We want that whole first quadrant to be filled in. After we streak our lawn, our first quadrant, we're gonna flame sterilize our loop. 
we're going to let it cool. Then we're going to do our six to eight directional streaks. So we're going to touch where quadrant one is and we're going to pull it out. We're going to touch where quadrant two is, we're going to pull it out. Same thing six to eight times, making sure to leave enough space between our streaks. After our second quadrant, we are going to flame our loop again. And then for quadrant three, we are going to streak six to eight directional streaks. Again, now we're pulling from quadrant two and we're gonna pull out. From quadrant two, pull out six to eight times. Now, between quadrant three and four, we are not going to flame our loop. We are simply going to turn our plate 90 degrees and we're gonna pull from quadrant three out back in, out, and we're gonna do our little zigzag into the open space, making sure not to hit any of our earlier quadrants. And so once we do this, once we streak for isolation, then we're going to take that blood auger plate, we're gonna turn it auger side up, and we're gonna put it in our incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna look at what does the bacteria look like on our throat culture. And so we're gonna now talk about what would the readout look like for this. So this is going to be day two, talking about our readout on our throat cultures. And so one of the lead people on characterizing streptococcus species and classifying them is a scientist by the name of Rebecca Lansfield. And Rebecca Lansfield helped to classify different streptococcus species. And so what she did was she took samples from people with a sore throat and compared that with the throat cultures from healthy people. And one of the things that she noticed is that people who had the sore throat, when they had those cultures, the colonies that were on there were matte, meaning they weren't shining. The healthy cultures, on the other hand, people who did not have a sore throat, when looking at their colonies, their colonies were shiny. And so she basically noticed that people who had a sore throat had these mat type colonies. And so she called the bacteria that are causing the sore throat, they have this M protein. And the M protein stands for mat. And so when she classified her streptococcus species, they are classified or separated based on their M protein. Now, what is the M protein? Well, you can think of the M protein, it's kind of like Velcro, and Streptococcus has this M protein that allows it to stick itself to the throat tissue. So it allows it to adhere to the back of the throat. Now, when it's adhered to the back of the throat, our phagocytes, which are our white blood cells that normally do what we call phagocytosis, where they engulf the foreign invader and destroy them, when the phagocytes go to that area, they can't get rid of them because that bacteria is tightly adhered to that throat. And so when the white blood cell, the phagocyte, tries to engulf it, it has a difficult time engulfing it because it's tightly adhered to that uh, throat. And so we say that the M protein has antiphagocytic properties. It helps the bacteria to prevent being um, phagocytosed, meaning it helps them to be, it helps them to evade the immune system. And so this M protein has this antiphagocytic properties. It makes it very sticky. It causes the bacteria to stick to the surface, in this case the throat, um, and therefore protects it against phagocytosis. And so Rebecca Lansfield went on to classify different groups of streptococcus based on their M protein. Now, when we look at blood auger, remember that I said that streptococcus is vestigious. They have very specific growth requirements. And so when they grow on blood auger, they can have these different appearances. So the first is what we call beta hemolysis. So this is beta hemolysis. So notice that this plate is red because this plate has red blood cells. So if the bacteria, if the streptococcus can use red blood cells as a food source, they will break down the red blood cells and they will break it down fully. And so we get this complete destruction of red blood cells. 
and we get these clear zones around the colony. Sometimes it looks a little more yellow, but basically it's clearing. When we hold that plate up to the light, we can actually see through the blood. The blood is no longer obscuring that part of the plate. So this is what we call beta hemolysis. You get these clear zones around the colony because we have complete destruction of red blood cells. What types of bacteria do beta hemolysis? Well, using Lancefield classifications, group A and group B strep, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So group A and group B strep are types of streptococcus that undergo beta hemolysis, meaning they use red blood cells as a food source. Some bacteria do what we call alpha hemolysis. And in alpha hemolysis, we get partial destruction of the red blood cells. So it's not broken down completely, it's only partially digested. And the hemoglobin gets broken down to what's called meth hemoglobin. And the meth hemoglobin um, is going to give it this kind of green appearance on the blood auger. And so if we look at alpha hemolysis, partial destruction of red blood cells, it only gets broken down into that meth hemoglobin, and you get these green zones around the colony. You get partial clearing. You start to see some clearing, but it's not fully clear like the beta hemolysis. And so of the bacteria that we test in the lab, the bacteria that you would see having alpha hemolysis would be streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae is alpha hemolytic. It does this alpha hemolysis. If we call something gamma hemolysis, this is the Greek symbol for gamma, gamma hemolysis. If we look on our blood auger, a plate that has gamma hemolysis, it's almost a misnomer because gamma hemolysis is actually no hemolysis. It's no breakdown of the red blood cells. So there's no damage to the red blood cells. There's actually no change in the auger. The bacteria grows on the auger, but it's not using the red blood cells as food. And so we can see the growth, but we don't get any clearing around where that growth is. And so of the bacteria that we look at, the bacteria that would fall under being gamma hemolytic would be streptococcus mutans and group D strep. Again, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna talk about all of these different types of strep in just a minute. But first I wanted to kind of talk about what are the types of patterns that we would see on blood auger? And so we might see beta hemolysis where the red blood cells are broken down. We might see alpha hemolysis where we get partial destruction and we get this kind of green appearance. And we could have gamma hemolysis, which again means no breakdown of the red blood cells. And there's no clearing. The bacteria grows on the plate, but it still looks like blood auger underneath. So here are some examples of plates that have these different types of hemolysis. So this plate has gamma hemolysis and this plate was streaked with Enterococcus faecalis. You can see that the bacteria grows, but notice that there's no change in the auger. The auger is still red, the red blood cells are still intact. If I look at strep pneumoniae, strep pneumoniae, remember, is alpha hemolytic. So what we can see is that where we see the bacteria growing, notice that the red blood cells are partially digested. They're partially broken down, and we get this kind of green appearance um, where the red blood cells used to be. In a little bit, we will talk about this optogen sensitivity, but for now, I just want you to focus on the type of hemolysis. So in this case, alpha hemolysis, right, we get partial destruction of um, the red blood cells, and we get this green appearance on our plate. On the flip side of this, if we're looking at beta hemolysis, notice that now we can see the stamp that's on this blood auger. The red blood cells have been completely destroyed. They have been broken down as food. And so this allows to have clearing, and this is our beta hemolysis. This is complete destruction of the red blood cells, and so now we get this clearing on the plate. So in our experiment, our beta hemolytic bacteria would be our strep pyogenes. Strep pyogenes is also bacitracin sensitive, which we will talk about in a minute. But for now, again, 
just focus on the type of hemolysis. So beta hemolysis, complete destruction of red blood cells, we get this clearing where the bacteria is growing, and that could be strep pyogenes. So here are some examples of throat cultures from students. And again, remember, if you're looking at a throat culture, you're not going to see just one type of bacteria. You are going to see a bunch of different bacteria growing on this plate. So if I look, let's say, at this culture over here on the left, I can see some colonies. This colony, for example, is beta hemolytic. Notice how it has this clear zone around the colony. We have some bacteria that is gamma hemolytic. It's not breaking down the red blood cells at all. And then we have others that are alpha hemolytic, right? They have partial destruction, and we see this green zone around the colony. And so when we do this, you guys would do your own throat cultures and then see what type of bacteria grows. If you have a large proportion of bacteria that are beta hemolytic, that have this clearing around the colony, that could be an indication that the patient has strep throat because the type of bacteria that is beta hemolytic, one of the types, would be streptococcus pyogenes. Strep pyogenes is going to be beta hemolytic. And so if we see a lot of those colonies, that could indicate that the patient does in fact have strep throat. If we look at this plate, this is a different plate, a different student. Notice we don't really see any beta hemolytic colonies. We see some alpha hemolysis, we see some gamma, um, but we don't see any beta hemolytic colonies. And so these are just some different examples of throat cultures and what they could look like. Now, when you guys would do this in class, if you were to do this in class and we were to look at our plates, there are ways by looking at the colonies to help identify what bacteria that could be. And so let me show you what I mean by that. So we have this table, and this table basically gives us information about what types of bacteria undergo these different types of hemolysis. So for alpha hemolysis, we could look at the colonies, and if we see small, clear, colorless colonies, or if we gram stain it, we gram stain it and it's gram positive cocci in chains, um, that could be alpha strep, so strep variodens, which is non-pathogenic. If we see colonies that are alpha hemolytic and they're small, clear, colorless, dimpled colonies, they could be streptococcus pneumoniae. And notice that it says pathogenic if more than 50% of the growth. So if you see a large percentage of this type of bacteria, it's possible that it is pathogenic and there is an infection. If we see small to medium, opaque, cream-colored to grayish-white colonies, could be Carinibacterium, which would be, in some cases, non-pathogenic. If we see colonies that are small to medium, opaque, gray to white colonies that are often described as this wagon wheel type shape, um, that could be Neisseria and non-pathogenic strains. And if you saw this, you wouldn't want to panic and think, oh man, I have gonorrhea in my mouth because Neisseria gonorrhea is a Neisseria. Don't panic, that's not what that tells you. This is typically going to be strains of Neisseria that are non-pathogenic. If we look at our beta hemolytic colonies, notice there are three main types that we might see on our plate. If the colonies are medium, opaque, dirty white, and rough, they could be bacillus species that are non-pathogenic. If we see colonies that are small, clear, colorless colonies, those could be strep pyogenes, group A strep. And again, if you have just a little bit of this, that doesn't indicate that you have an active infection. If you only have a little bit, it's likely that you are a carrier of strep pyogenes. About 5% of the population carries strep pyogenes as part of their normal flora. If you have an overwhelming population of this, that's a different story. Then that indicates that you likely have an active infection of strep pyogenes, meaning you have strep throat. Another alternative, if you see colonies that are medium, opaque, golden yellow, 
those could be Staph aureus. And they must be coagulase positive to be considered pathogenic. And so notice that if we see these beta hemolytic colonies, we can't say for sure that, that it's strep pyogenes. And so notice if we compare strep and staph, remember back to the lab where we talked about species of staph and we compared and contrasted staph and strep, there was a rapid test that can be used to identify um, if it is staph or strep. And that rapid test that we could do, so if we had this unknown beta hemolytic colony and we wanted to know was it staph or strep, the rapid test that we could do would be a catalase test. Because remember, for a catalase test, all we have to do is we take our slide, we could pick up the colony in question, the one that's beta hemolytic, we could put that on our slide and then add hydrogen peroxide. If it bubbles when hydrogen peroxide is added, that means that the organism is catalase positive. Those bubbles, remember, are oxygen. And if we get catalase positive, that means that the organism uses O2 as their final electron acceptor. Staph aureus is a facultative anaerobe. It grows with or without oxygen, but grows better with because it uses O2 as its final electron acceptor. Streptococcus, remember, are aerotolerant anaerobes. They tolerate oxygen, but they don't use it. So if it were catalase positive, you're looking at staphylococcus. If it is catalase negative, streptococcus. So that is a rapid way that we can distinguish staph from strep. And in our quiz, You'll notice that on your list of um, what to study for the quiz, it says catalase on there. And you might wonder, well, we're not covering catalase right now. And that's true, we're not. But the reason that's on there is that is the way that we can do a rapid determination if it is staph or strep. That's a really quick way. We could gram stain it, right? Because they're gonna look different in a gram stain. Streptococcus, remember, is going to be gram-positive cocci and chains. Staphylococcus is going to be gram-positive cocci and clusters. That takes a little bit longer. A catalase test is much faster. You will also see that one of the ways that you could determine if it is strep pyogenes is that you can do what's called a bacitracin sensitivity test. And so in the lab, when students get these beta hemolytic colonies, if they want to confirm if those colonies are strep pyogenes, they would pick up that colony of interest. They'd pick up that beta hemolytic colony. They would streak that colony on a new blood auger plate. And then they would place a bacitracin disc. So remember back to our Kirby Bauer test. And we talked about antibiotic sensitivity. So they could take a bacitracin disc and put it on that lawn that they streak and then see if the bacteria is sensitive to bacitracin. If it's sensitive to bacitracin, strep pyogenes. So these are just some different ways to identify the different types of colonies on a throat culture. You do not need to memorize this table. This is just for your information so that if you were to do this at some point, you could look at those colonies and try and identify what type of bacteria are there. But again, in no way do you need to memorize this table. It's more just kind of for your information. And again, when we do this in class and in person, it's a lot of fun to try and figure out what bacteria you have as part of your normal flora. This part of the table basically is describing the types of gamma hemolytic colonies. So again, if we look at the types of gamma hemolytic colonies, there are lots of different types. And again, this is their possible identification. So this is again there just for your information, but you will not be tested on this. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about some examples of different types of streptococcus. So the first Lancefield classification that we're gonna talk about is going to be our group A strep. And our group A strep is a category of bacteria that is beta hemolytic. So again, they're going to break down red blood cells for food. An example of a group A strep would be Streptococcus pyogenes. 
Streptococcus, again, tells you the shape, the morphology, and the arrangement, right? They're coccus or spherical, and they're in chains. Pyogenes, pyo refers to pus. These are pus-forming bacteria. Streptococcus pyogenes is pathogenic. It does cause disease. But about 5% of humans are carriers of Streptococcus pyogenes. It's part of their normal flora. However, if this bacteria becomes um, super prominent, meaning again, you see a lot of this on a throat culture, that means that the patient could have strep throat. And so Streptococcus pyogenes can cause strep throat or pharyngitis. It can also progress to something called scarlet fever. And so if we look at these pictures, so down here, we have this patient's throat. It's really red and inflamed. And in some cases, again, you're gonna see pustules. One of the first signs of scarlet fever, scarlet fever is when the bacteria becomes systemic. So if strep throat, for example, is left untreated, it can progress to scarlet fever. And so one of the first signs of scarlet fever is this phenomenon called a strawberry tongue. And in a strawberry tongue, the tongue becomes kind of red and swollen. It might have this white, um, this white coating on it. Um, it could be painful, etc. And so this can be an early sign of scarlet fever. Another sign of scarlet fever is that you can get this characteristic red rash. And this is typically, so once scarlet fever starts, um, this red rash can appear, although the rash can appear up to seven days later. Now, what happens is in this, certain strep bacteria produce a toxin or a poison that cause some people to break out in this rash. And this is the scarlet, the red of the scarlet fever. This rash may first appear on the neck underarms and groin, so the area where your stomach meets the thighs, and then spread over the um, spread over the body. Typically, the rash begins a small, flat, uh, red blotches that gradually become these fine bumps and feel like sandpaper. And the scarlet rash generally fades in about seven days. As the rash fades, the skin may peel around the fingertips, the, to the toes, and the groin area. And this peeling can last up to several weeks. One of the hallmarks of this rash, one of the things that um, can kind of help give you an indication that this could be scarlet fever, is that normally when you press on your skin and you release, you get this phenomenon called blanching, where the skin becomes white under where you put the pressure. In the case of the rash for scarlet fever, if you press on the skin and release, it doesn't do that blanching, it doesn't become white. There's been damage to those blood vessels, and so that's that redness that's underneath the skin. And so that's one of the signs that that rash could in fact be scarlet fever. If scarlet fever progresses, it can lead to autoimmune diseases. And so there are several types of autoimmune diseases that can result from the complication of scarlet fever. We can get what's called rheumatic fever, Rheumatic fever is going to lead to heart valve damage. And that's because the heart valve has a protein that looks similar to the M protein for streptococcus. And so if you have this untreated strep pyogenes infection and your immune system is constantly producing antibodies against that M protein, well, it's possible that that M protein or that antibody is going to start attacking your heart valve because your heart valve has a similar protein. And so this is that autoimmune disease. So you get this complication where the patient ends up with this rheumatic fever and they get damage to their heart valve because their own immune system is trying to react with the strep pyogenes that's in the body. And during the process of this, they're actually damaging their own cells. It's actually damaging their own body and it leads to heart valve damage. Another autoimmune disorder that can happen because of strep pyogenes is referred to as glomerulonephritis, so inflammation of the kidney. This can lead to damage of the kidneys. And so again, for strep pyogenes, it's best to be treated because if left unchecked, 
Um, it can progress to scarlet fever, meaning it becomes systemic. And then ultimately that could also lead to several types of autoimmune disorders. Strep pyogenes is also the main cause of what is called necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is flesh-eating disease where the bacteria starts on the skin and it starts to eat the skin or eat the tissue around it. And that those that tissue damage becomes larger and larger as the bacteria grows. So about 75% of all necrotizing fasciitis cases are caused by strep pyogenes. Remember that we also saw that uh, staph aureus can also cause necrotizing fasciitis. But strep pyogenes is much more common. About 75% of flesh-eating bacteria cases are caused by strep pyogenes. Strep pyogenes can also cause what we call toxic shock syndrome. And so for females, if you've ever noticed on the box of tampons that you might buy, it might tell you to change your tampon often and failure to do so may lead to toxic shock syndrome. And so that can happen because the bacteria, remember that strep pyogenes is beta hemolytic. So if that bacteria is in, let's say the vaginal area, then that bacteria can use the red blood cells as food. And if it uses the red blood cells as food, meaning the tampon is soaked in blood, well, the bacteria is gonna to start to grow there and that can lead to toxic shock syndrome. It can cause a whole host of problems um, in somebody that has toxic shock syndrome. And so the way to, to help prevent against that is simply to change that tampon often so that the bacteria is not sitting there and feeding on that blood-soaked tampon. So group B strep is the next one we're gonna talk about. So this is a different Lancefield classification. Group B strep is also beta hemolytic. It also uses red blood cells as food. And so our example of a group B strep, Streptococcus agalecti. Streptococcus agalecti may be found as normal flora in the gastrointestinal tract. So this is in the gut. About 25% of females are vaginal and or anal carriers, meaning that they have it in their vaginal or anal region. Now, the reason that that's important, and there's a question in your question set that asks about being carriers of a beta hemolytic organism. The one that matters to know if you're a carrier, the one that we need to know this is for Streptococcus agalecti. Because if you are female and you happen to be a carrier of strep agalecti or group B strep in the vaginal area, that is a major neonatal pathogen. This leads to pneumonia, sepsis, meningitis, and potentially death in a newborn. So we need to know if you're female and you're pregnant, doctors would need to know if you happen to be a carrier of this group B strep. And so women are typically screened at about 35 to 37 weeks um, in their pregnancy prior to childbirth. So when they're getting to the end of being full term, the doctor is going to screen and see if the woman is a carrier of this group B strep. Because if she happens to carry this group B strep, and remember that as the baby passes through the vaginal canal, it could take in some of this bacteria, and if they do, it leads to, remember, a whole host of issues. And so what happens is, is that women are screened to see if they carry this bacteria, and then they're given this prophylactic treatment with penicillin during labor, meaning that once she goes into labor, they're gonna give her penicillin, they're gonna give her an antibiotic to basically treat the bacteria, to get it to go away, so that when the baby passes through the birth canal, it doesn't take in that strep agalecti. And so this is why it's important to know if a patient is a carrier of strep agalecti. It's important for females who are pregnant. And so there's about a 50% mortality rate for newborns if not treated right away. So it can be very, very severe. And so this is why we need to know for females when they're pregnant, if they carry this group B strep, because if they do, they need to be given antibiotics during labor to prevent transmission to the baby. Group B strep can also be pathogenic 
in immunocompromised patients as well. So not only for newborns, but also can be pathogenic for immunocompromised patients. So this is the group of beta hemolytic organisms that we need to know if we're carriers for this organism. Strep pyogenes, remember I said 5% of the population carry strep pyogenes. We don't necessarily need to know who are the carriers of strep pyogenes, but we do need to know for females who are pregnant if there are carriers of streptococcus agalecti because that agalecti um, is the one that's gonna cause problems in newborns. And so if we treat the mother prior to giving birth, then she's going to prevent transmission to the baby, which leads to complications. And so that's the one that we need to know if somebody is a carrier. Now for group C strep, in the purpose of this, we are going to skip group C strep. Group C strep is a group of bacteria that are transmitted from animals to humans. So we're not gonna focus on those, and instead we're gonna skip over to group D strep. Group D strep is gonna be gamma hemolytic. Remember, meaning? that it does not use red blood cells as food. So an example of a group D strep, Enterococcus faecalis. It used to be a streptococcus, but was renamed. So Enterococcus faecalis is still a streptococcus, but it just has a different name. Faecalis, faecalis refers to feces. This is carried by 100% of humans as normal flora. And faecalis tells you that it's normally going to be found in the gut. It's home, it's normal flora in the gut. Now, when it's in the gut, no problem, right? Again, 100% of people carry it as part of their normal flora. However, if the bacteria gets out of the gut, that's when we have problems. And so infections result um, in areas of the body outside the gastrointestinal tract. And this can lead to sepsis. It can cause an infection in the peritoneal cavity. Um, an example of this would be, for example, if there was a gunshot, right? And let's say that the patient had a gunshot wound and it penetrated or perforated the bowel. And the contents of the bowel, that feces and all that bacteria, went into the peritoneal cavity. Well, if all that bacteria gets into this peritoneal cavity, that can cause an infection. And so... This type of damage to the colon can also happen from a colonoscopy. It's less common, um, but it can during a colonoscopy when they're putting the camera through your gut to check your colon. If they happen to slightly perforate the bowel or make a little hole in the bowel and the contents spill into the peritoneal cavity, then it can cause a problem. Another big issue with Enterococcus faecalis is that we can have what's called vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, or VRE. VRE has become a major nosocomial pathogen, meaning it's a hospital-acquired pathogen. You go into the hospital for something else, and you leave with this VRE. And the problem with this is vancomycin used to kind of be one of our last resort antibiotics, but this bacteria has become resistant to it. And so that is very problematic. It's very difficult to treat. And so it's a major problem in terms of hospital acquired infections. The next group of streptococcus that we're gonna talk about are the non-Lancefield classification. So the ones that don't fall into group A, B, C, or D. They're not group A, B, C, or D streptococcus species. These are non-Lancefield classification. We have streptococcus mutans. Streptococcus mutans is gamma hemolytic. It's a bacteria that's carried by 100% of humans. And Streptococcus mutans is found in the mouth. So everybody has it in their mouth. So what this bacteria does is that it uses sucrose or table sugar to make dextran, which is this large complex polysaccharide. This then causes a scum or a biofilm and plaque to build up. So if you've ever gone to bed at night and forgot to brush your teeth and you wake up in the morning and your teeth have that slimy feeling on them, well, that slimy feeling is that biofilm that formed. And that is by Streptococcus mutans. If you don't brush your teeth and that bacteria is left there sitting on your teeth, 
They're going to take the sugar that you've eaten throughout the day and they're going to make that dextran. They're going to form that biofilm and form that plaque. By the time you feel that slimy feeling on your teeth, that bacteria is about 500 cells deep. That's how deep that biofilm is already formed. Now, if we have that biofilm that has the bacteria in it with the sugars, remember that when bacteria metabolize sugars, they produce acids. Remember that acids are the product. If we get a buildup of acids, that erodes the enamel of the tooth and that can lead to cavities. And so this is why it's so important to brush our teeth often because we don't want that biofilm to fit to sit there because if that biofilm is there with all that bacteria, all that streptococcus mutans, and it sits there on our teeth with sugars, it's gonna produce acids, which ultimately leads to cavities. And so toothpaste, for example, has fluoride in it, and fluoride, remember, is an oxidizing agent. It helps to kill the bacteria. And so that fluoride is gonna kill the bacteria to help reduce streptococcus mutans so that we don't have this biofilm which produces those acids, which lead to cavities. And so this is what streptococcus mutans causes. Streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae is alpha hemolytic. So remember, it does partial destruction of red blood cells. It forms that greenish hue around the colonies. And like you can guess, it causes pneumonia. This is the most common form of pneumonia. So there are other organisms that cause pneumonia as well, but this is the most common cause of pneumonia. About 50% of people carry strep pneumonia as part of their normal flora. They carry it, but it doesn't cause infection. For this type of pneumonia, there is a vaccine available. It's called a pneumovax or a polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine or a PPV vaccine. And that helps to protect against this type of pneumonia. This is typically given um, to elderly patients or to people who have um, various lung conditions, like if somebody is asthmatic or if they have COPD or other types of lung conditions, um, they will often be given that pneumovax vaccine to help protect them against streptococcus pneumoniae because it can cause pneumonia. So now we're gonna look at our test that help us differentiate between if we're looking at strep pyogenes or strep agalecti or strep mutans, et cetera. And so we're gonna start out by dealing with our CAMP test. And so we're gonna talk about our setup for our CAMP test. So the purpose of a CAMP test is to identify and confirm the presence of group B strep. So we are looking for, is strep agalecti present? In this part of the experiment, there are four organisms that we would test. We would test streptococcus agalecti. Again, that one causes a serious infection in newborns. We have streptococcus pyogenes, which causes strep throat. We have strep, streptococcus mutans, which causes cavities. We have streptococcus enterococcus, which is now enterococcus faecalis. And again, that's normally found in the GI tract. And then we have our streptococcus pneumoniae, which causes pneumonia. And so what we would do in this test, if we were in lab, is we would give you five unknown bacteria. You would be given one of these five organisms. And you would set up this test to help determine which bacteria you have. So this would be done in pairs. So you and a partner would do this you would be given one blood auger plate and you would be given one strep unknown. It would be one of those five organisms. And so what you would do is you would dip your sterilized loop into the bacteria and then you would streak a lawn. So you would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You would streak this lawn and cover about a half to a third of the plate. And so you would just put that unknown bacteria all over this plate. You would then flame your loop and sterilize, and you would do one, um, one line, one broad streak of Staph aureus. What we're gonna be doing in this test is we're looking for synergy between group B strep 
and Staph aureus. So we would do one broad streak of Staph aureus. Flame our loop, let it cool. Then we would do two streaks, two broad streaks, perpendicular to Staph aureus. So again, it's pulling down from the lawn and leaving about a quarter inch gap. We would do that twice. So we'd have two broad streaks leaving this gap. This is our camp test. So this lawn with these lines down and Staph aureus, that is the camp test. On this plate, we would add other tests. These other tests are not part of the camp test, but they are important. So on the lawn, we would add an optogen sensitivity disc. So an optogen disc that has the antibiotic optogen. And we would add a bacitracin disc. These are just two different antibiotics. So these are separate tests, but they're being done on the camp plate. They're basically gonna put these discs onto this lawn. The other thing that you would do during this test, in addition to making this camp plate with those two antibiotic sensitivity tests, you would also take your strep unknown and you would streak what's called a bile esculin slant. We are going to talk about this bile esculin slant later on. So we would also streak a bile esculin slant and then incubate with the cap loose. So let's talk about what the results for this would look like. So this is our camp test, day two, which is our readout. And so again, in our camp test, the purpose is to identify and confirm the presence of group B strep. And again, that group B strep is gonna be our streptococcus agalecti. So what we're looking for is, remember that we streak a lawn, and then we do a line down. We also have Staph aureus that is streaked perpendicular to this line coming down. Now, you might recall Staph aureus is beta hemolytic, right? It undergoes beta hemolysis. So what happens is, is it, if your unknown bacteria, if your unknown bacteria is Strep agalecti, that bacteria is going to produce this special protein. And this protein is called a camp protein. It's just named after the people who discovered it. You don't have to memorize what CAMP stands for, but group B strep or strep agalecti makes this CAMP protein. Staph aureus makes beta hemolysis. And so these two proteins, this beta hemolysis and this um, CAMP protein, these two proteins are synergistic. So they're both secreting these, and the way we can identify an organism as being CAMP positive is we get this triangular zone of clearing. This enhanced clearing because these two proteins are synergistic. They're working in synergy to help with hemolysis even better. So when we're looking at a positive CAMP test, you get this triangular zone of clearing. You can see that this part here is beta hemolytic. The red blood cells have been broken down and the reason it has this triangular zone is because of these two proteins being made by the opposite bacteria and they are synergistic. And so that's what a positive CAMP test would look like. Remember that on our plate, not only do we have the CAMP test, this, this part's the CAMP test on the left, but we also have some antibiotic sensitivity that is um, tested on those plates as well. And so in this case, we're looking for positive for antibiotic sensitivity or basically clearing around the disc. That means that the bacteria is sensitive to this antibiotic. That's why we get this clearing. This one is not sensitive, right? The bacteria grew right up next to the disc. So if we're doing this on the optogen disc, the optogen disc is called the O-disc. So you wanna know that the O-disc is the optogen disc. And if we see optogen sensitivity, we are looking at strep pneumoniae. Strep pneumoniae, remember, is alpha hemolytic. And so you're gonna see in a minute on a different plate, you're gonna be able to see that this bacteria has alpha hemolysis and it's also sensitive to optogen. If we see bacitracin sensitivity, bacitracin sensitivity 
The basotracin is what we call the A disc. And if we see clearing around the basotracin disc, meaning we see sensitivity to basotracin, strep pyogenes. Strep pyogenes, remember, is group A strep. It is beta hemolytic. And again, this is what I talked about earlier, where if you do a throat culture and you see a colony that is beta hemolytic, remember that it could be strep pyogenes or it could be staph aureus. One of the ways to test that is to restreak a new plate and then put a bacitracin disc on it. If it is sensitive, you're looking at strep pyogenes. So next we're going to look at our bile esculent auger. So in our bile esculent auger, the purpose of this test is to select for the growth of enterococcus for presumptive identification. And specifically, we're looking for enterococcus faecalis. So in this test, not only are we looking for enterococcus, but specifically we are trying to identify enterococcus faecalis. So you wanna add that to the purpose. We are trying to not only identify enterococcus, but to identif identify enterococcus faecalis. And so when we do this, we do this by using this type of media called bile esculent auger. And so if we look at the recipe for this auger, you will see several ingredients. The first is gonna be peptones. Peptones are there for general growth, right? They're just food for general growth. Next, we have oxgal. Oxgal, remember the gallbladder of an ox, it's our source of bile salts. You might recall that you've seen bile salts before. And you've seen bile salts before when we looked at the BGLB, brilliant green lactose bile green, or brilliant green lactose bile broth. That BGLB broth has bile in it. If you remember, BGLB is there to identify coliforms. Coliforms are gram negative. So the bile was there to inhibit gram positive. Now notice we're looking at enterococcus. Enterococcus, remember, is a streptococcus. Streptococcus is gram positive. Bile salts inhibit gram positive. But the key is that they inhibit gram positive except enterococcus. Enterococcus is not inhibited by the bile salts. So it's inhibiting all gram positive except enterococcus. This makes oxgaller bile salts a selective ingredient. Sodium azide is there to inhibit gram negative. This is another selective ingredient. So notice because we have two selective ingredients, the only thing that can grow on this plate, the only thing that can grow is enterococcus. So if we see growth at all on this type of media, it has to be an enterococcus. Esculin has glucose in it, and it's a special food source. So it's a special food source that E. faecalis can metabolize. So this, esculin, is our differential ingredient. It's differential because E. faecalis can metabolize it, but other enterococcus do not. So that's our differential ingredient. We need a way to detect if esculin is metabolized. That's where our ferric citrate comes in. This is going to be a reagent. It's a reagent that we don't add after, though. It's a reagent that we add. Um, it's already in the media. So we, we don't add this after. It's already in there. But the ferric citrate in the media is a reagent that turns brown with what's called esculetin. Esculetin is a product of esculin metabolism. So if esculin is metabolized, it produces esculetin, and esculetin with the ferric citrate is gonna turn brown. So let's take a look at this. So remember I said that the esculin is a certain, a special type of food source, and if esculin is metabolized, it gets broken down into two products. Glucose, glucose can then be used for glycolysis. This is how it serves as a food source. And the second product is gonna be that esculetin. So if esculin is metabolized, if it is used as a food source, 
it will produce that escalidin. The escalidin is going to interact with the ferric citrate. So here's the iron. And if escalidin is present and it interacts with the iron, it's going to form a dark brown color. So let's talk about what it looks like on the plate, or in our case, we do this on a slant. So if we see growth, right, if we see growth, but no brown. Growth, but no brown. Any growth tells us enterococcus, but it's not brown, which means that it did not metabolize esculin. So what that tells us, so growth but not brown, tells us it's enterococcus but not E. faecalis. This is a negative, right? It's an enterococcus, but it's not E. faecalis. In this test, we're trying to identify enterococcus faecalis. So growth but no brown is an enterococcus but not E. faecalis. That's a negative in this test. There's another negative in this test. And the other negative in this test is no growth. No growth means it's not an enterococcus. It's some other type of bacteria. That is still negative. It's not E. faecalis. So for this test, we have two negatives. Growth, but not brown, which is an enterococcus, but not E. faecalis. Or no growth, which tells us it's not an enterococcus. It's some other type of bacteria. On the other hand, if we see growth plus the dark brown color, right, growth plus dark brown is going to be presumptive E. faecalis. That's our positive. So the way I remember this, it's growth and it's dark brown. I think of dark brown as being poop, feces. Faecalis looks like feces or poop. So that's how I remember what the positive looks like in this. If I'm trying to identify E. faecalis, it's going to be dark brown color like poop. It's a bacteria that's found in feces. And so, again, esculin is, is our differential ingredient. E. faecalis will metabolize it and produce esculidin. Esculidin interacts with the iron, and it forms a dark brown color. And so that would be presumptive E. faecalis. That's our positive. So... Let's talk about how we identify our different types of bacteria. So, strep pyogenes, remember it's Lancefield classification is group A strep. It's beta hemolytic, and it's sensitive to bacitracin. Out of these five, it's the only one that is sensitive to bacitracin. So, if we see bacteria that's beta hemolytic and it's sensitive to bacitracin, we're looking at strep pyogenes. Strep agalecti is a group B strep. It is beta hemolytic, and its differential test is the CAMP test. It's the only one that is CAMP positive. We have Enterococcus faecalis. Enterococcus faecalis is our group D strep. It is gamma hemolytic, which means it does not digest red blood cells, and its differential test is going to be the bile esculin. It's bile esculin positive. I'll come back to mutans. Let's skip down to Streptococcus pneumoniae. It is non-Lancefield. It is alpha hemolytic. And its differential test is that it's sensitive to optogen. It's the only one out of five that is sensitive to optogen, the O-disc. Strep mutans is going to be non-Lancefield. It's gamma hemolytic. And it's negative for all four of those tests. It's not sensitive to bacitracin, it's not camp positive, it's not bile esculin positive, and it's not sensitive to optogen. So by default, if you see that, it's, you're looking at, in this case, strep mutans. So this table or the next slide, which is in picture form, you need to know this. You need to be able, based on these results, to be able to differentiate which of these five bacteria we're looking at and what is their Lancefield classification, what is their type of hemolysis? So here is a different way to look at this. I'm a very visual person. I like color coding. So I made this slide to kind of help you break it down. So if we see alpha hemolysis, remember that's the auger turning that greenish color, and we see optogen sensitivity, we are looking at streptococcus pneumoniae. This is non-Lancefield. So alpha hemolysis, optogen sensitivity, strep pneumoniae. If we see beta hemolysis, there are two tests that we need to use to differentiate between the two that are beta hemolytic. 
If we see bacitracin sensitivity, strep pyogenes, which remember again is our group A strep. If, on the other hand, it's camp positive, it's streptococcus agalecti, which is group B strep. So this is the test that allows you to differentiate between these two. If we see gamma hemolysis, meaning that the blood is not broken down, the colonies still have the red underneath it, so it's gamma hemolytic, but it's bile esculin positive, we're looking at enterococcus faecalis, which is our group D strep. If it is gamma hemolytic and it's negative for all tests, again, by default, it's streptococcus mutans, which is non-Lancefield. So you want to either study in a lot of detail this slide or the table before it. I myself, I'm very visual. I like color coding. So for me, this is a lot easier to remember, but either way would work for how you want to study this. So let's look at what these actually look like. So we set up this test with the five bacteria that we're testing. And so what we're looking at here on the left, we have strep agalecti. Notice that here's the bacteria growing. And in this case, it's not sensitive to optogen. It's not sensitive to bacitracin. The bacteria grows right up next to it. When we see these lines down, and again, this is our staph aureus here, notice we see this triangular zone of clearing, this enhanced synergy. This one is camp positive. So this is strep agalecti because it has this triangular zone of clearing. So this is strep agalecti. Here we have strep pyogenes. Remember that pyogenes is beta hemolytic. Notice we can see right through it. Now you might notice in this case, it doesn't look yellow, it looks black. It only looks black because it's on a black background. But you can see the clearing. You can see that the red blood cells have been broken down. It's not camp positive. Notice we don't have this triangular clearing. It's not sensitive to optogen, but it is sensitive to bacitracin. So it's beta hemolytic and it's sensitive to bacitracin. This is strep pyogenes. Next, we have strep pneumoniae. Notice it's not camp positive. We don't see that triangular clearing down here. It's not sensitive to bacitracin, but it is sensitive to optogen. Notice the bacteria does not grow around that. So it's sensitive to optogen, and it's alpha hemolytic. It's partially digested. Notice it's not all the way clear. That is strep pneumoniae. Next, we have our enterococcus faecalis. It's not camp positive. Notice we don't see this clearing here. It's not sensitive to optogen. It's not sensitive to bacitracin, right? And if we need to determine enterococcus faecalis, you're going to see in a minute that this by itself doesn't tell us that it's E. faecalis. We need this with a bile esculin auger. If we look at mutans, if we're looking at just the plate alone, notice that it is not sensitive to optogen not sensitive to bacitracin, it's gamma hemolytic, it did not use the red blood cells as food, and it's not camp positive. So notice that mutans and enterococcus faecalis are the same at this point. They look identical. The next test that you would need to differentiate those would be our bile esculin auger. And so if we do this, we do ours on a slant, and so this is an uninoculated control tube. This is a bile esculin auger um, ahead of time, so before it's even inoculated. Notice that when we put E. faecalis on it, E. faecalis will grow, right, because it's an enterococcus, and it turns the auger that dark brown because it's able to metabolize the esculin, and it forms esculetin. The esculetin interacts with the ferric citrate, and it produces that dark brown color. So if you see that previous plate with a positive on bile esculin auger, this is our positive on bile esculin, combining those together, that tells you E. faecalis. And if it's negative for everything, then it's by default strep mutans. And so this concludes our identification of streptococcus species.